Hi, my name is Anya Pavel. I'm the author of The Garden of Stone Houses, and I'd like to welcome you to season 10 of the Writing Community Chat Show. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And please don't forget to subscribe to the Writing Community Chat Show's YouTube channel. And then if you like today's show, hit like and also comment in the comment section. Enjoy. You're tuned into the Writing Community Chat Show, the live streaming YouTube podcast that brings you the stories of authors, screenwriters, and more. Indie or established, this show's for the community. We invite you to be a part of it. Head to the writingcommunitychatshow.com for more info. The WCCS, together as one, we get it done. Welcome, it is Friday, and you are watching the Writing Community Chat Show. Hello everybody, uh, welcome to this week's Writing Community Chat Show. It's amazing to be back and celebrate the weekend like we always do. Coming up on tonight's show, we have an author, uh, Geetha Lodge. Um, she's a Sunday Times bestseller. There's lots of amazing things going on with her career, which we'll get stuck into. And um, that's going to be very exciting. But before that, Chris, how are you doing? How's your week been? Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. As you may be able to tell... I'm a little bit festive this weekend. Um, you do look very festive, Chris. Uh, there's something different about your background. Yeah, I always have just a really plain background. And even worse than that at times, I remember when we were doing the show a couple of years ago, I had just a brick wall in the background. <laughs> um, so to have a Christmas tree is very different. But I spent a good a good few hours putting it up. Um, so, yeah, I thought I could share the experience of the Christmas tree. Absolutely. We have had some questionable backgrounds, I still do, um, and some hairstyles and all sorts of funny things going on the past couple of years, Chris, um, mm -hmm. like we pointed out last week on the after show. Um, it's going to be a good show today, and I'm really excited. But according to the chat in our chat and on Twitter and me and you conversation-wise, we've all had a pretty long week, and um, I'm kind of glad to get to this point and really kind of celebrate the end of it um, with some fun. Joanna on uh, in the comments says, tree, loves the tree. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Anya and Halo. Um, Brandon, thank you. Nice to see you all in the chat. I hope you're going to enjoy yourselves tonight and hope you've had a great week. Um, yeah. Do you know, Chris, it has been a tough week, but we had something really exciting happen to us this week in terms of the Chris versus Chris challenge that Stephen J. Gold set us last week. He... Sorry, I was just pausing my mic then because somebody really interrupted me by coming through the door. <laughs> um, I just wondered what happened. You just kind of froze. So you yeah, I, I froze for dramatic tension. Um, but what happened was Stephen J. Golds, um, he is attached to Punk Magazine, Punk Noir Magazine, sorry. And for Chris versus Chris, he published um, my poem and your poem uh, for the challenge that he set us on the show a couple of weeks ago. Now, it's having the guests set the challenges has been something that's just taken everything to a new level um, because we never know what's going to come out of the, you know, the guests coming up with the challenges and we've got a really difficult one next week, but having a poem published this week in Punk Noir magazine was a real highlight. It was, it was a great week. Absolutely. And, and of course um, that was set by Steve Gold, who was our previous guest and um, he hasn't got back to us about that, but of course you won the first, uh, Chris versus Chris challenge, which was Brandon's book cover design challenge. And um, guys, that is open to next month as well. Uh, if you want your book to be designed by us in that challenge, then please get in touch on the email, which is the writing community chat show at gmail.com. And we will get back to you with details about that. Um, and yeah, the challenges are going quite well, Chris. And we had a fantastic uh, challenge yesterday by one of our patrons, didn't we? We did. And when that message came in, I'd had a few drinks because I've been watching the football and I immediately got my phone out and started that tongue twister. Um, oh, really? OK, this, yeah. is, this is quick. So I've got one and it's ready. And I, I was trying to do it and I couldn't do it. Um, but it may have been that I'd consumed too many beverages because <laughs> I gave likely. it to Paige and she just she just smashed it out and was like, that's not a tongue twister. Um, Brilliant. You're just drunk. 
I have no <laughs> idea how to write a tongue twister, but for you guys, uh, we've actually got the video here, thanks to Ross. Um, like I said, one of our patrons, he's been a fabulous support of this show for a long, long time. Um, and he made this brilliant animation, which he does often uh, on, his, on his social account. So I have put a link to that in the description as well. But thank you for this and check this video out. <laughs> Hello, this is, uh, well, I'm Grim, and, and this is BZ, and we have a challenge um, to to offer to the writing community chat show. Uh, hi, it's it's not that complicated, really. Wait, this says they're called Chris and Chris. What, they couldn't think of a name between them? It's not not really relevant right now. All right, okay. Um, so this, this is the deal, nice and simple. Part one is to write a tongue twister. I love it, I love a good tongue twister. I mean, the way that you just use the needles to wrap it. I think in this instance, a tongue twister is not the same as the tool you're, you're referring to. Oh, oh wait, this, this just means like, you know, how, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Yep, that is a, a good good example. Or sea shells, sea sheep, sea shell, sea. The one with the S's. Right. Write a tongue twister. That's part one. So, a amazing video, as you can see from the comments coming in there. A lot of love for that, Ross. And interestingly, Chris, part one, which would suggest know, there could be a part me. two to this. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's been very kind for part one. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm scared for part two, I'm not going to lie. Definitely. Um, thank you again, Ross. Absolutely amazing. So let's get tonight's guest on because there's going to be a lot to talk about. And of course, um, it's very exciting when we do get a guest on and we can have a good conversation with that person. And guys in the chat, of course, we love your questions coming in, whether they're for all of us um, or as a group or individually, whether they're about writing or something else so please don't be afraid to send your questions in and enjoy the chat so tonight's guest uh that person released their debut in 2019 it was released by penguin random house in the uk and in the us it was translated into 12 other languages which is amazing it was a richard and judy book club pick and it became a sunday times and new york times bestseller and she is now here promoting a fifth book which is the fourth in the jonas uh, sheen series Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Geetha Lodge. Hello, Geetha. Hello. Oh, actually, um, you to introduce me whenever I walk into a room. That was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us, because as you made, made us aware today, you weren't feeling well this week, and uh, um, I'm amazed that you managed to make your time for us. So thank you so much, and I hope you're feeling better now. Oh, it's such a such a nice thing. I mean, not just because you're better than coughing up my lungs on a sofa, but also nice. because uh, I've been really looking forward to it. And then I was worrying by, by the end of the week that it wasn't going to happen. And then I'm so pleased that actually the stuff has cleared a bit and I have something of a brain back. So, yay. <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, I'm glad we're better than coughing up on the sofa. But there you go. Um, yeah, brilliant for you, to, for you to be here. And uh, where are you coming from in the world, if you don't mind? Uh, so I'm in Cambridge. Very nice. And I'm guessing it's as cold there as it is here right now? It's quite chilly. It's quite chilly. Um, I actually made it out of the house today for the first time since last Friday um, for a little bit just to go and pick my son up from the Christmas fair and uh, kind of regretted my choices. But the thing that made me feel better was he was flipping freezing. So I was like, ha. <laughs> I to do this for a short while. You have been freezing for ages. So, yeah. Oh, he I'm, really I'm does. Loving, loving my yeah. It really does feel like the temperatures dropped in the last couple of days in the UK yeah. here. Um, and, and we whinge about, well, I whinge about that. And some of our audience in America, they've, they've been talking about snow for weeks. So, you know. This is true. Um, this is true. Yeah. We, we <laughs> well, get it very easy. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, so we're going to find out some things about you today, uh, about your writing journey, about your books currently, and, and what might be coming out soon. And like I said to the audience, if you've got questions, please send them in. But first of all, what we'd like to find out is kind of how writing started in your life. Uh, what were the inspirations and where do they come from, if you don't mind? Oh, that's a good question. So I, I, I kind of often wonder where it all comes from with all authors. I think for me, 
I love, I've always loved to kind of escape into books. Like I think a lot of people mm. who like to write have always loved that. But I also love gobbing on at people about stories. I <laughs> love it. I was always that annoying kid who came home from school and had 59 stories from my parents about everything that had happened at school. And they claim now that it was actually quite interesting. I think they're being nice. Mm. I don't think it was that interesting. But I think um, you, you do, when you, I, I was one of four, and I was a, for a middle child for a while. And I think when you're vying for attention like that, you kind of quite quickly learn when people are and aren't interested in your stories. So I got <laughs> to learn what was at least to a certain extent grabbing people's attention. I also went through a real fantasist phase. From when I was like five to seven, I just didn't know the difference between stuff I'd thought of in my head and stuff that was real, which was very strange for everybody who was talking to me. I just used to you know, go off in my world and then tell people stuff as if it were true, which could become incredibly awkward for my parents when they then would go up to another parent and say, oh, I hear your son's selling a bike. And it wasn't even slightly true. <laughs> like <it> was, <laughs> I just decided in my head that that was happening. And then, you know, so, um, and then fortunately reality kind of started to seep back in again for me. Um, mm. But I, I suppose that's probably all not particularly uncommon for, for an author. Um, mm. so I know we all come from different places, different positions in the family, some only children, some not. Mm. Did, did you find so yourself? Much... Oh, sorry, sorry. Chris. sorry, Chris. I was just going to say it makes so much sense thinking about that as a as a child. You must think, what's everybody else doing? Like, Because I, I still think about this as an adult sometimes in reference to Truman Show. I'm thinking, imagine if it was all just Truman Show style and sometimes yeah. creating like pathways for other people is a really good sort of writing tool I suppose I think it's so true and I think I think this idea of being able to kind of control that becomes quite addictive um mm. because the world can be really awful sometimes can't it and I definitely think there are times when I where the motivation to write a book is something something horrible has happened in the world and it's upset me so much that I want to take that and turn it into a story where I can make the resolution have some sort of justice. Mm. And I know that that is an urge that I have. And, you know, that, that there are events, things that terrible things that happen to children, to women, to men. And I just want to sort of twist that in a way where, you know, you can see that you know, just, justice of some kind happened, even though it's not necessarily a straight line and it's not as simple as they just immediately get arrested or whatever it is. I think that's really, it's really tempting, isn't it? Because lack mm. of control is scary and horrible and we all have to endure it sometimes. And I think uh, I think a lot of crime writers explore that quite a lot. Yeah. I was going to mention that, that when you talked about growing up with, with your kind of other, other siblings, was mm. there, when there was craving for that attention, were you using stories with each other or telling stories with each other? Do you think that ever played a part in you becoming an author in, in that sense that you love storytelling? Yeah, I, I, the, what, the only, the only sibling I think I told sort of directly stories to just alone um, was my youngest sister, who's nine years younger than I am, and I, she was kind of like my sort of surrogate child in many ways. Um, I did a lot of bringing her up. She's now moved back in my house, and seriously, it's like having a second child. <laughs> it's hilarious. They just they squabble. I'm like, guys, come on, let's be sensible. I mean, you know, she's thirty. And uh, and I'm just treating them like their kids. It's hilarious. But um, but yeah, I think I did. I used to definitely when she was going to sleep at night, I used to make stories up for her, mm. um, which are more the fantasy stories. And and I was learning how to kind of put them together on the fly and how to kind of structure them. But um, with the rest of my family, it was more kind of the you know the kind of the raconteur thing you do when you just. You know, you get a story. And, and the interesting thing was, I used to pretend if someone said something funny at school, if it was me, I used to pretend someone else had said it because I didn't want them thinking I was boasting or or I didn't feel confident that anyone would think it was funny if I'd said it. So mm -hmm. I would tell these stories as if someone else was saying some of the things. Mm -hmm. And like I was just watching. But actually often I'd been involved and I was telling them as if I was just a watcher, which is a weird thing to do, I think. But in some ways it made it feel safer because... I wasn't putting myself out there. I was just telling them a scene. And then if they didn't approve of my behavior, it didn't matter. It's not me. Yeah. And I think there's a little bit of that, I think, as a novelist, isn't there? You're like, mm -hmm. you do feel safe because you, you can put all this stuff out there. And yes, it's your baby and it's your heart and soul in some ways, but they are your characters. They're not you. You're not expressing your opinions. And mm -hmm. 
it's much less hard in some ways than just going on Twitter and trying to say an opinion and then having everyone tell you that you know you're wrong and that it's that you know that you're a bad person or whatever it is. So mm. I think it's a really interesting thing that. Mm. Yeah. So with you being a crime writer, did it start at an early age? Was there a point when you were like, I'm going to tell my sister a story tonight and I'm going to scare the shit out of her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Weirdly, most of the stories I told her were fantasy. I, I've always read kind of everything, but I did read mm. a lot of crime because both my parents read crime. Mm. Um, but my dad read a lot of sci-fi. So that was a big part of my life as well. In fact, fantasy I came to a bit later because I had to discover it for myself. Um, but um, no, they the the crime thing was definitely something I was doing just for myself because I enjoyed it. And I think I was drawn to it because I'd read kind of a real range of those books. And I definitely started reading the darker stuff way too young. Like I was reading, I was reading at 12, I was reading um, like Ian Rankin, Val McDermott and I just sort of moved on from my fear of the Agatha Christie's and Dorothy Sayers, which I loved, but then I was on to those. And mm. it was actually quite uh, quite scarring, I think, in some ways, because those are dark stories. But I think it yeah. also taught me a lot about you know, the, the deeper side of crime, the more characterful side of crime. Because Dorothy Sayers will do that at times, and Agatha Christie will as well, but it's always still quite comfortable. There are very few times when they really kind of really peel everything back and make you confront how awful all of this is. And I think uh, Val and Ian both do that amazingly. And I think that was the real difference for me. And I was really drawn to that. So I started writing mm. these um, quite dark kind of um, crime stories and not showing my sister because you know, I, I did worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> so Siri in ranking now as well, isn't it? Um, what about yeah. authors but, that we yeah. loved? We had a few Aww. beers with him on the show. Um, so, mm. At what point did you actually take those storytelling sort of times when you were younger and think, actually, I want to put this on paper? And, you know, do you remember that process at the time and, and kind of how old you were? Well, they were kind of happening alongside each other. I definitely remember when I was seven, my mum taking the pee out of me because she went to see my teacher at school who said, I didn't write stories, I wrote books <laughs> at school. <laughs> and she was like, "She, I can't, you know, she won't finish them because they're too long. And she mm -hmm. loves writing them. And then from there, you know, even when I was really quite young, I, I mean, the first novel I finished was when I was 14. And I was mm -hmm. writing it like in the back of class when I should have been yeah. like, concentrating. Um, and just all the time, because I loved it. And I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I've written this amazing book. And then I sent it off to um, to uh, Tim Manson, who was a really senior editor at Transworld. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, I was like, you know he's gonna love it and stuff and and fortunately he was a really nice guy and he rang me up because i was obviously very young and mm. um and he basically explained to me why i wasn't ready to be published yet but he was really encouraging and really nice mm. um, and yeah and he basically said you know he didn't say it was a steaming turd of a book <laughs> i was quite aware later on that it had been a steaming turd and um but that there was potential and mm -hmm. I used to keep going and keep working and, and stuff. And it would have been so nice, actually, if he'd still been working by the time I, you know, became an adult. And, you know, because I kept on going and I kept writing. And then once mm -hmm. I got to about 18, I tried to spit some, some agents and then didn't get anywhere. And then I became a playwright, kept trying, kept trying. But, you know, it took until I was 28 to, to get an agent. Um, mm. And then another five years after that to get a contract. Mad. Wow. So, long process so how many books do you reckon you wrote between 18 and sort of like getting the agent in the bag type thing well i think she lies in wait was my seventh novel which has oh, wow. my date with my seventh novel um lots of those i wrote and i was like this is bad <laughs> like this wasn't very good <laughs> and and then i was like i'll write another one um and then um the one that i got signed for wasn't the one that i got the contract for which is apparently yeah. very common actually i hadn't realized i was really mm gutted that my first one didn't get a contract but then actually and my agent was like no actually it's really common you know you then mm. you know you just go write the second one and um yeah that and that one had had some edits as well so I'd spent a mm. while with her on that one so yeah it was I think it was my seventh um and in the before while I was waiting for editors to very slowly get back on that first one I started writing some fantasy stuff for kids on Wattpad mm. which was immense yep. fun 
I love Wattpad mm. because you just get loads of feedback once you get to a certain point. And yeah. people are constantly telling you to keep writing and keep going. And mm. it's really, it was great motivation to do a completely different thing while I was sitting waiting. And I still felt like a writer. And, um, mm. and I loved that. And I should do something with those at some point because I've got a, a YA book and I've got a kid's book and they've had mil literally millions of reads and I've done nothing mm. with them. It's really, it's really pathetic. <laughs> but they're just there. And, mm. um, and I enjoyed them. So that's the main thing. Yeah. Definitely. So a lot of people would like get really infuriated by, you know, writing a book and finishing a book and then being like, oh, that didn't get me an agent. I'm going to write another one. Like, I think a lot of people wouldn't get to seven. I think they would stop at like a, maybe a couple. So what was that motivation for you to just keep going and keep finding the strength to write another book? Because they're not easy things to do. No, they're not. I think I'm quite pig-headed. Um, I think also because I was a playwright for a while, I was seeing them more as it became more as just a process. You know, I was very used to writing and producing something mm. and then getting feedback and either, you know, in those cases, those were being performed. So I was still getting a creative outlet in that direction. Mm. And then the novels I was doing on the side. And I suppose because of that, it wasn't, it, it didn't seem quite so hard as if I'd just been doing the books. And I think that mm. made a real difference to me. Plus I saw all of it as honing my craft. I'm not saying I didn't find it upsetting each time I got a rejection, because I think we all do. And that is mm. just a thing. And that's, that is completely okay. It's totally okay to have mm. a strop and be like, oh, I'm never doing this again. And then change your mind the next day. That's fine, you know. Um, but I, and I think because I'd had a lot of success with the plays, Mm. I felt like I can do this. I just need to work out how to do, you know, how to do the books and what it is that's stopping me. And the weird thing for me was actually what made the difference was there was a book that I had subbed to agents and not got any positive replies, which I then subbed. And the only thing that I changed was so I went and did the creative writing MA at UEA. The only thing mm. I changed was one of the guys there taught me how to pitch it and write a synopsis. Because mm. basically my synopsis that I was writing every time was incredibly confusing. <laughs> and was just a series of plot points with way too many names and way too much detail in. And basically every every agent would start reading it and be like, oh my God, I just can't even keep up with this and basically wouldn't read the book. Understandable. Because it was, if you can't, if you can't, if someone can't write a synopsis, you don't really trust them to write a novel, I think. Yeah. And um, he basically just said to me, you need to learn how to write the story in a synopsis. And he's like, you get three paragraphs, you need to learn how to do this. And he, And I did it and then, I then had six agents wanting to sign me. Same. That's incredible. Of, yeah, insane, hey? And mm. um, so then I was like, oh, so it wasn't the writing, it was the writing of the synopsis, which is still writing, but it was um, it was so fascinating, so yeah. Does that make you want to read some, uh, write this synops uh, synopsis for the rest of the seven books you had before now, or? I mean, I'd rewrite them very heavily if I did. Yeah. I can now <laughs> okay, so loads of stuff that I would change. Um, and yeah. that's cool. Like, that's a nice thing. I mean, there are, there are things I would now change about the first book that was published because mm. I've learned more since. And I think that's always such a nice thing that you're always learning. The only annoying thing is you don't get to edit it after the event, do mm. you? So when you started writing in the world of plays, did you feel like you had to do a big adjustment to write for that? Or did you kind of naturally transition? That was such a weirdly natural experience because I'd done so much theatre. I was always on stage yeah, and uh, just doing Amdram and stuff and then uni plays and things that it made, it was, it made no sense not to write it. And then I was like, why didn't I do this before? It's great fun. And it's really easy to do when you know the theatre and you're doing a lot of it. So I just started writing and then I really enjoyed it. And I ended up basically doing that for seven years and, um, got a little theatre company together and we toured and we won awards and it was brill. And really the only two things that stopped me doing it for longer were firstly that I had a, then had a child and it's very hard to talk plays when you've got a child. Mm. Um, and you know, the income is very like this, mm. very reliable. Um, so I was doing like copywriting on the side in the down seasons, but that you know, is still very difficult to manage. But then the other thing was I really wanted to do the books. So, I just mm. thought, well, if I go and do the MA, sorry, <coughs> a cough needs to happen. <laughs> <coughs> but um, yeah, I thought if I went and did the MA, then I'd learn um, how to do this other stuff. And um, and then I could go from there. And, mm. um, and actually, that's exactly what, what did happen, which was great. 
So with the with the MA, um, I've recently just done an MA, and now I'm a big advocate for trying to save people a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. So if you had to give somebody a tip from the MA that you have taken from it, without them going on it and spending all that money <laughs> on yeah, doing yeah. an MA, what tip would you give them? So, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me, honestly, was write the story, not the plot. So essentially nobody is going to understand more than maybe maybe three names in a synopsis maybe mm. two ideally but maybe three because mm. you can't remember them you just cannot remember them when you are reading something you you're completely unfamiliar with mm. you give them three names max you give them and you work out what the story of your book is the story is not this person is trying to do this thing and they go to this country, but then this thing happens and then they meet a person like this and then this happens and then this happens and this happens. The story is, for example, um, uh, like, like let's do a film, I suppose. Um, um, uh, the film, so like, let's look at, like do the film Avatar. Hmm. So the story of that film is not everything that happens in that film. The story is, um, is he called Jake? He's called Jake, isn't he? So I thought Jake, you were going to say the story is Pocahontas but blue. Well, I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> but so, so basically, so, so Jake goes to a planet as a soldier to try and help them undermine the locals and get knowledge in order to beat them. And for, instead, falls in love with one of the locals um, and realises that the only thing for him to do is to fight to save them. That's like the story, right? And you can expand mm -hmm. that a little bit. You can put a twist in. You could give a teeny bit more detail. But that is the story. And then you put the ending on because it's a synopsis for an agent. They want to see the ending. But mm. literally, that, you could almost do it in like five sentences. And you could do it. And so he was like, you've got three paragraphs, Geetha. And that mm. was great. That worked for me. And, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and I think also the thing that's really good about that is it makes you have to stop and think about what the story actually is. And mm. when you then go back and look at your book, you look at the bits which actually aren't necessary to the story as well. And that mm. is genius. So that, that will be the bit that I think was really, really worth the money. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and yeah, I don't think they, I don't think they always are worth all the money. I think that was, I think that's the bit for me that changed everything. I think there were other bits that, you know, probably weren't. Um, mm. um, I think I had some great advice from a few very good writers, which I really appreciated. Um, but that was that was the really you know mm. life changing bit for me. But there we go. We've you know everyone knows it now. It's fine. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure um, a lot of people, a lot of writers, overlook how important a blurb is or um, yeah. a synopsis is, and it's one of those things that is probably the first, as you mentioned, for an agent to look at, and but also for a reader to want to buy the book from reading the blurb. So it's probably something we need to work on a lot more. Um, and I, yeah. I, as a personal experience, I don't think I concentrated that much on that area. And I wonder how many other people do the same. Mm. Yeah, I don't think I thought it was particularly important either. But of course, if you think about the actual process, mostly it gets read by an assistant first. And for them to get excited, they need to be excited about the concept. And if they don't understand the concept. Like, mm -hmm. really, and they've got to think about how they want to be able to sell it to people. You know, to sell it to publishers and then how publishers are going to sell it to bookshops and how bookshops are going to sell it to people. Mm. that's actually quite important so it's funny and um I sort of felt a little bit ashamed that actually you know my previous job before I became a playwright was I was in marketing and I still hadn't really thought about that so <laughs> well the, the big the Around big the mystery to marketing that affects us all I think um mm. there's a lot of people in this community uh including me and Chris that we, we still struggle with marketing and it's like an illusion um but do you have a marketing tip as a marketing uh, professional God, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think do do the bits that you love and do them hard. I think don't mm. try and do everything. Like if you mm. love, so I love I love Facebook. I always have. It's just it's something I'm very familiar with. I used to work on it quite a lot, so I'm very familiar with it. I'm very comfortable with it. Um, and you know, audiences are on Facebook, but I do Facebook because I because it's I'm very comfortable with it. I had a little bit of an ethical issue with it at one point, but other than that. <laughs> You know, I like Facebook. It it works for me. So I do that a lot. I spend a mm. bit of time on other platforms. 
Mm. I don't try and do those to the same level as I do Facebook or I wouldn't be able to write. And I think, mm. so pick the one that you like. If you're, a, if you're a video person, then, you know, then do TikTok. And I do mm. videos on TikTok sometimes. I think I've gone on for about six months, but I sometimes do videos on TikTok when I feel like it, but I'm not going to make it my entire thing until mm. I, unless I suddenly decide that I really want to and then I get obsessed with it, in which case, fine. But mm. I think it's so much mental effort if you're trying to make yourself do something that you really don't want to do. Yeah. So, Geetha, we had somebody on. We, we do a chat on a Tuesday, which is just like a – it's an open platform uh, on Twitter, which is Twitter Spaces, and we called it See You Next Tuesday. Um, and we actually had somebody on the show um, – <laughs> Just say, where does that divide end between the writer of the book and then the the marketing side of the book? Like this person, I'm not going to name who they are because uh, they might not want me to, but they've got a, a really good book out. Uh, it's their first debut novel, doing quite well. Um, but they seem really frustrated with that sort of whole side of I'm the writer. I wanted to write this book and then I've been told that I have to do all these marketing elements now that i'm not necessarily comfortable with mm. you know because a lot of writers are just i'm in my room leave me alone i'm doing this it's, thing yeah this um, is the thing. where does that stop and how, what, what's your advice with that i i so agree but i think there are clever ways of getting around that if you don't want to be doing things in a face-to-face -face way there are so many other things you can be doing it's still some time but it's not necessarily if you're not someone who wants to be sharing videos or photographs or tweeting all the time for example sharing quizzes or interesting facts um or other just finding other things that you do like to share mm. um that that make you happy um or like say you're just randomly interested in in a certain topic um mm. some people do incredibly well by sharing random bits of research information that they come across you can mm. do that without it actually interrupting your day much because you're already looking them up and it's not really much. You just go on there, you go on, you add it to your Facebook or you'll add it to your Twitter. Those mm. things are really good to do because they just keep your content going without you really having to do much. But you don't necessarily have to be talking to camera all the time. The interesting thing is that that whole idea, it's such a strange thing, isn't it? Because it's so new mm. and yet it's so expected now. And mm. I think it is lovely if you can do it because readers then feel that they kind of get to know you. But yeah. as you say, we're writers. We don't have to be an extrovert. We don't mm. have to be someone who, you know, who goes out there and talks. And actually, my publishers did a great job with one person who really, really, really is not that person and just said, I cannot do that. And they were like, it's completely fine. They did an event, an online event for him for his launch instead, mm. where it was just a kind of like a game. And mm. it worked brilliantly. People loved it. And mm. I don't think they felt it was any less engaging than, a, than an in-person event. And if anything, I think they enjoyed it more because it was different. Mm. And I think that sort of thing, you know, I sort of would like, you know, all publishers and publicists and marketers to be really aware of that, to be just mm. thinking, you don't have to do the normal boring thing. It doesn't have to be an unboxing video, you know, mm. which often are quite cringy. I find them like I find it quite hard to do one which doesn't make me cringe and yeah. I'm always looking for ways. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so sorry, just, oh, sorry, Chris, go on. Sorry, uh, just jump in there before we move on to the next part, Chris. And, and of course, you can put your question in before that. Uh, if we can jump back to watching in the dark, um, which was your debut, um, that had all those accolades and won all those awards and Sunday Times bestseller and all of these amazing things. When you finally had that seventh book or the eighth book, whichever it was, hit that kind of height, um, how did you finally feel? And, and did you kind of think that affected you in a, in a different way? And then did that take you build on the pressure for your next novel? I think it was very weird because I think after that long, you kind of, um, you have these dual feelings. I had very much set myself up for it probably won't do that well because yeah. I was so used to things not quite working out. And that made me in some ways appreciate it more, but in some ways could not quite believe it. And I think that's very interesting. Also, the interesting thing that happened with me was the week I thought it was going to be a Sunday Times bestseller, maybe, the week I thought it had a chance, it just missed. And then the following week, to my absolute surprise, it suddenly went in. So I honestly thought, like, oh, I was like, oh, I've missed out on being a Sunday Times bestseller. But it's like, and I'd, I'd gone through this whole thing of being like, come on, grow up. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't matter. It's just a thing, it's just a number. 
and I'd schooled myself and gone like, right, and I'd moved on. And then it suddenly popped in and I was just like, oh, so then I was just like, I don't really know how to feel now. <laughs> like, it was a very, <laughs> you know, very <laughs> There's a joke there, but I'm not going to make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, but as, I, as I mentioned, then obviously you, you were obviously overwhelmed or probably overwhelmed and, and, and super excited about all that happened at that point. But then when you started writing your next book, did you suddenly feel, I now have to hit that kind of quality again? Well, luckily, I'd actually written the first draft and a bit of the second draft by the time that happened. So that was nice. good. Um, and also, I think there is a really big advantage, you know, to failing a lot before you get published, because I knew I could write lots of books. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> I was like, I can, I can write loads of these. I didn't have any doubts that I could write another book. And um, they all got better as I'd gone along. So I was just like, yeah, the next one will be a bit better. That was my feeling, you know, and... Mm. And it had, and it was a different sort of book. So the so the first one, it's like looking back at, at you know on a cold case. So it's thirty years ago. Um, this girl's gone missing, and then the second one is much more is much more modern because it's the same detectives, but of course they cover the New Forest and they cover Southampton. So we move into the city, and it's much more kind of technological, and it's about uh, it's a lot about observation and who's watching and whether you know they're watching. Um, it's about a, a guy basically witnessing his girlfriend's murder over Skype, which is quite horrible. Mm -hmm. And um, because it was really different as well, I think that also helped because I was just like, well, it's actually just its own thing. You know, it's just the team is the same, which is comforting, but then the actual story and the setting is different. And that was, I think, really helpful. The, the only thing I did wrong, I think, was trying to plan it too much, that first mm. draft. Um, they really wanted, and I think it's very understandable, um, my editor and agent wanted to see a really hefty plan. And I think that's very natural because a lot of writers who... Have spent a would have spent a long time on book one, and they won't necessarily know how to approach book two. Yeah. Um, so they wanted to see this really detailed plan, and I did this really detailed plan, and I tried to stick to it. And actually, that mm. that that was silly because I didn't listen to all the cues in my head on that when I was first writing. That went, but this is this now needs to change. Like I now know at this point this doesn't feel right because the reader's going to be thinking this, and this needs to twist here, and then I end up having to completely gut that first draft because it just needed to go in different directions and then it was much better like it was much better i actually changed the killer mm. and i was like i've made the wrong decision here change it and um mm. yeah so how do you know the difference between a good idea for a book and an idea that can actually become a book especially when you, you know you've had so many or well, written so many now like some people have one book in them maybe and then you're like, oh, I've got another one. Oh, I've got another one. Uh, so how do you know that that idea is tangible enough to take it into a full length novel and, you know, make it? I wonder if you just become, what do you, do you guys reckon? I think you just become familiar with how, how an idea feels when it comes to you. Is it an idea which immediately gives you this, then this, then this, then this? Or is it just yeah. an idea? And I'm always wary of the single idea because a single idea might sound good, but if mm -hmm. it doesn't immediately kind of make you go, and this and this and this then i don't know i mean I, I do remember with my third book i had had this new idea and actually i changed what i was writing so i had this we'd agreed what i was writing and i just had this other idea and i was like i think it's better and <laughs> i um and it's quite an out there it was quite this you know it's this it's this uh, woman louise waking up after a night out not no, she's in no way like me of course wakes up after a night out where she kind of can't remember what happened, how she got home. And she rolls <laughs> over and tries to cuddle her husband. And then she realizes the guy next to her is not her husband and he's dead. And she's like, what happened? And then she panics and it's all bad. And um, I had that very strong vision for that. And mm. that one took me a little bit longer to work out how the frick that had happened. <laughs> but <laughs> what I immediately knew from that though was, the reason I knew it was the right idea was I knew immediately that she had a marriage to her husband, with her husband that was rocky because he criticised her for drinking, for binge drinking, and was totally unwilling to take any responsibility for why she binge drank, and that mm. actually quite a lot of it was because of things that he did, and that I immediately knew, and that she mm. would go out with a friend who would encourage the drinking. That, that, was, that was immediately obvious to me. And mm. from there, I then it was just working out, okay, but how did he end up, how did that bit happen? I did what I normally do when I'm not sure, 
exactly how my plots are going to work out. And I, I, I zoomed my writer friend, or I think at that point I called him because we weren't mm. doing Zoom that way. Um, and I said, right, ask me the right questions so I can figure this out. <laughs> and, then, um, and then he did. And I was like, oh, of course that's how it happened. And then, and then it was mm. obvious that was how it happened. And I was like, right. We're, we're good I, to go. I'm going to intervene here, Chris, and I'm going to play the trailer and uh, the book trailer from our book sponsor today, and then we'll jump into a little bit about Little Sister, um, and then we'll get some questions from the community if you're happy with that. Fabulous. Yeah, all good. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thank you to our, our book sponsor this week, guys. Um, a service you can take up again. Email us the writing community chat show at gmail.com, and we'll give you some details. Dave suffers from OCF, obsessive compulsive fatalism. Every day he is compelled to follow his online horoscope and to actively seek out and participate in their prophecies. One fated day, the signs are so compelling they embolden him to take a high stakes horse racing gamble. The consequence of his wager will lead Dave into situations way beyond his control and comfort zone and his path will be crossed by an intriguing hopscotch of larger-than-life characters. This eccentric bunch of strangers include a Benny Hill-loving vicar, a transvestite, a hippie, a diamond thief, a sausage-roll-addicted bank manager, an underworld female mechanic, an hungry man, some piranha fish, a chimpanzee, and many others. Pluto's in Uranus is the story of a trier whose lucky omens will come back to taunt him. Kushti Bok! This 2020 release sits in the humour category and is rated 4.7 out of 5 on Amazon. It was written by Patrick Haylock, who supported this show by becoming the book sponsor. Please find the link to his book in the description of this show. Thank you. Patrick, uh... <laughs> You did not prepare me for that, mate. What do you mean? Super. Someone's had you over there, guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, thank you so much for sponsoring the show. Ignore Chris, Hooli. That sounds fantastic. Um, oh, well, you over, I'm you. I love that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I mean, we, didn't, we didn't stick to Githa's rule of only three people. I mean, well, I got lost it was a lot of it. Of it was a lot of it. It was like, what's going on here? Some piranhas in there as well, Chris. Uh, there was a lot in yeah. there. Uh, but oh, thank geez. you so much, Patrick, for sponsoring the show with that book book uh, promotion. Um, I will help you promote that. Uh, but it was. It's 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 got great reviews. Um, <laughs> Chris, come on. Oh, um, yeah, brilliant. So. Uh, <laughs> Only on this show with Pluto, Pluto in Uranus. Pluto's in Uranus, yes. I know. See, I'm, I'm that parent who, like, when my when my son was really small and we were at the play area and he was playing Planets games, he just went, I'm coming into Uranus now, and I just lost <laughs> it. And all the other parents looked so disgusted with me, but I just uh, couldn't help it. I was just like, that's just the worst. <laughs> I think innuendo is an amazing thing. <laughs> it's fantastic. I'm it so is. fan. I'm so I'm so buying this book. This is great. I can just imagine you like a like a play center type thing, you know, like a oh, I don't know what, what you'd refer to it as in America, but like a wacky warehouse, you know, indoor play area. Um, saying that, like just losing your mind, and then all these mums just looking at you and judging you. Yeah, <laughs> it's all it's all good. It's all funny, <laughs> right? We're we're enjoying this too much because we're running out of time. We're not yet, but we're getting there. So what we want to do is. Keitha, can you please let everybody know what your current book, Little Sister, is all about? Uh, and then we'll get into some questions about that, please. I'm sure I've literally mentioned all of the other ones and not the one that we've <laughs> That's good, because otherwise the section wouldn't work, would it? There you go. Go for, go for it. Fantastic. Okay, great. Well, Little Sister, which is... Um, so it's the fourth Jonas Jeans, but they're all completely fine to read as a standalone. I have made sure of it. Um, so a Little Sister, uh, Jonah, who is uh, the lead detective, is trying to enjoy a quiet pint in a country pub and it's a very well deserved one it's an idyllic september afternoon it's 30 degrees and uh the lager is gloriously cold in the middle of this lovely scene comes a 16 year old girl she is very calm and very collected but she is also completely covered in blood wow. jonah figures it's his job to be the one to step forward and ask if she needs any help so he does 
But when he asks if she's okay, she says she's fine. And then she smiles at him and says it's her sister that they ought to be worried about. And when he asks what's happened to her sister, she says she won't tell them until he's listened to everything she's got to say. And it becomes very quickly apparent that she's very clever, very manipulative and really likes to play games. Mm -hmm. So that's Bill's awesome. time. Awesome. Did you say when they were in the pub, it was 30 degrees in September? Yeah, yeah. Based on this happened, this happened um, uh, on my son's uh, my son's birthday, um, and it was just like a September afternoon of like thirty degrees, and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm like, I'm gonna. <laughs> that should be documented. <laughs> yeah. I know exactly. It was glorious. It was absolutely glorious. I and mean, I just lift this and put it. It was actually when he was like one, um, but it was absolutely mm. perfect and blissful, and it shouldn't have been. And there's something about that that makes you just want to trash it. <laughs> like, just walk in there and ruin it with death. Um, I um, think. And he says, sounds like a great book. Got, I assume she means if she's got oh, a book. Um, Thanks, Halo says, book sounds awesome. Ross says, that sounds brilliant. So a lot of fans of that book there. Um, little sister, has it got anything to do with the fact that you had a good relationship with your little sister? I think it might have more to do with the fact that um, she decided to move back into my house. <laughs> 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 well. That's really harsh. No, no, yeah. no, it's probably... Um, <laughs> Um, no, I think uh, I think I think sisters are fascinating. Um, I think I love the dynamic between them, and I think it's really interesting. Um, it's probably not so much to do with my relationship with her or my older sister, actually, because I get to be both younger and older sister. Um, mm -hmm. In that, uh, it's quite it's kind of you're kind of watching. She so she tells her story. And there's a lot of, it's very, you know what I've managed to do with this book? It's fascinating. From that point onwards, it's quite hard to talk about without giving spoilers. But mm. I can say some things um, because it twists around an awful lot. And um, uh, the fun thing is there are lots of clues that Keely has hidden for the detectives to find. But they're also there for the readers to find, which mm. I had great fun doing. They are yeah. hidden and they are, you, you can actually work out where um where to look next as well so that's quite fun um but she um she tells a story of how she and her sister ended up in care in the care system in the uk and how basically it was really rough for them it was horrible as it is for quite a number of kids every year who mm. go through it and um basically she she tells a story of abuse now there were three abuse claims made by these sisters which were dismissed after investigation so the big question is do we listen to her uh someone who's clearly a psychopath um should the fact that she's a psychopath mean we do or don't listen to her and is she just playing with them all and it's a constant question um mm -hmm. and a lot of what we're hearing as well is basically her the, the gradual um development of her relationship with her sister from them being really close to outside influences and manipulations basically making her hate her and how that can happen to two people um and there are a lot of a lot of things that could have come in and cause that there's the one of them is the fact that they both fall in love with the same boy and that's a really hard thing um mm. but it's 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 a um it's one of those stories where there there are some dark themes but they're never hopefully gratuitous i've, I've been you know really really careful about that i think it's really important that they you know speak for themselves but also there is, you know, it's, it is, there is enjoyment to be had in the story from, of someone like that because she is so mm. clever and she's so, um, she's so devious. You know, just watching her at play is so much fun. Um, mm. And, uh, and then things, you know, everything that you think turns out not, not to be quite what you think quite a few times over and then hopefully it's lots of fun. Mm. I have a, a question off one of the reviews for this book. Um, so I'll read the bit of the review and I'll ask the question off the back of it. And of course, it's a five star review, if it would be anything else. Uh, it says every one of Geetha's books are impossible to put down. But somehow this one had me even more obsessed. This is the fourth book in the series. But as other reviews have mentioned, it would make an easy first read, too. And you spoke about this when you spoke about the book. Um, my question is, how do you make something in the series readable for a first time reader? no matter what the sequence is yeah so I, I i think putting a lot of time this is to i try and i, and I always look at the reviews to see if i've succeeded because i worry about this a lot but basically it's uh, so my aim is always to make sure 
that the story is never assuming that they know anything. So that whenever you introduce characters, you give the reader a little summary. Mm. Um, you make sure that the story is complete in and of itself. And it really is. So the movement from start to finish, even for the police team, their stories are still an arc within that book. So we still know that they start one place and they finish another place. You know that things are going to continue to develop beyond and you know that they've developed before, but you know where you started and you know where you've got to. And the there aren't too many characters that you're introduced to in rapid succession as well. I think that's really important. And I do think, I will say, I think the second book is the hardest to drop into because it has it there are slightly more characters introduced at the beginning. And I think I got the balance of that one slightly less tight. And I wouldn't start with the second one. I would start with one of the other ones. But um, <laughs> being honest, got to be honest. Um, I wish I'd done the balance of the number of characters at the beginning slightly differently. I think it's mm -hmm. slightly harder. Um, but I think all of those things are the plan to try and make it as easy as possible. Because I know how much I like dropping into series. So mm -hmm. I was like, I want other readers to be able to do that and to feel that they're, you know, engaged from the start. So do you use your reviews then in, in a way of sort of like going, I need to develop this character more in this novel because, you know, people seem to really relate to this character or they really like this one. Like, is that how you it's use it? Or do you try and like go, I've got a, like a sort of five book plan for this character that I'm going to sort of develop? It's a really difficult one to judge. I think reviews are so interesting in that I think they always tell you something. Sometimes they're telling you more about the reader than they are about your book because mm. you can't appeal, to, you're never going to appeal to everyone. And you know mm. that sometimes when someone says something, you're like, I totally get why that person didn't like the book because actually it's not their cup of tea. Like yeah. they want something that's that's um, not character driven. It's just action. That's fine. That's not, that's not me. Um, they don't like the psychological side or whatever it is. Um, that all they wanted something that was lighter or whatever it is that there's always that there are the, all these differences within the genre i think um so i think it's really interesting to read them and i think not i never feel particularly offended if someone doesn't you know gel with it and that's cool um and i think it's about working out whether to whether you go that makes me think i should change or not i think if everybody was saying one thing i might think i, I i'm at that point i'm going yeah that's an interesting thing i should maybe think about moving in that direction if only a few were saying it I probably, I might bear it in mind. If it's something I was thinking, oh yeah, that's a great idea. I want to do that. Then fab, mm. I'll do it. Um, but I think, I think it's it can be very easy to get dragged in every different direction with reviews. Mm. One thing I definitely did listen to is people saying there are an awful lot of names at the beginning of this one, and I was like, yeah, they are right actually. Um, <laughs> there are a lot, and I was like, that is hard going on a reader, and mm. I was switching between surname and. Um, uh, title for uh, for Jonah, uh, who's the DCI, and I was like, actually, there's no real reason I have to do that. Um, so I'm going to pare that down and make it easier, you know, because surnames mm -hmm. and I've already got surnames and first names in there. Um, that's quite hard. So I think I was just trying to make that a bit, make it a bit simpler. And I think you know, mm -hmm. as it goes on, I'll think of a way to simplify as well. But um, but yeah, it's it's such an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, yeah, what do you mm -hmm. guys do? Uh, well, I was going to you threw me off there because I was going to ask you a question about how you come up with names, um, how that one comes to you, because that that's always an interesting thing. Um, like yeah. with me, sometimes the name just pops in. Sometimes I have to really yeah. think about it. I, I hate writing names. It takes me Do forever. You? Do you? I, yeah. like, I like it, but when I wrote my first one, Someone tweeted saying they all sounded like the names that if you ask like a kid to choose the names, that's what they come up with. <laughs> they're like, they're all just so weird. And I was like, mm. oh, maybe my radar for weird names is a bit out because I'm called Geetha and I just figure every other name is quite normal. <laughs> like, I, don't know. I was like, yeah, maybe it's just me. And I was like, maybe I just need to make them slightly more normal in the next book. Um, I mean, this is going to sound like I write loads of stories about old ladies. I don't. Uh, but whenever I do, I always use the name Doris. And apparently being a Doris <laughs> is a thing. Uh, really? Yeah. So like Love that was it. one of the things that I learned on my MA. Again, is it worth the money? Um, but my <laughs> <lecture> <laughs> to be my fair, Chris has he, said, privately promoted this show since he's finished the MA, saying that he learned more from our guests than he has on the MA. So Excellent. you know that, well, that's I did. 
I did. I no. genuinely did. Um, but the yeah, the Doris thing was new to me. Um, they said, "Oh, I really like that. It's quite clever how you've used." <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. Doris um, so apparently, Doris is an old lady name uh, that I is used quite frequently. Embarrassing thing when I um in a book. Uh, it went in. In, a, in fact, it was in Little Sister. The first draft of Little Sister. Um, I accidentally had three people called Sammy in it, and I don't it like. Yeah, when you're like, how did I do that? Basically, I had, so I'd sort of done one on purpose, to, a double up on purpose, because mm -hmm. I had a girl in this care home called Sammy, and like Ben Lightman, his police officer, sister's called Sammy, and it was a point of connection between them. He was like, mm -hmm. oh, my sister's a Samantha. She's called mm -hmm. Sammy. She's like, well, I'm more of a Sam. But they're kind of called Sammy. And then mm -hmm. I accidentally called the bad guy Sammy. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> oh, God. And then it's fine, because the bad guy changed anyway. So yeah. it all changed and it was fine. But in the first draft, I was like, that is quite poor. Like, what was I thinking? I'm <laughs> going to have to jump in here, guys, because we are, we are running out of time. And it, it always happens when we have fun. And we've got some brilliant questions in the chat and some fantastically weird ones. Right. Um, Love it. Are you going to ask Agate to say that name, Annie? Of course, I said it at the start of the show. Thank you, Ross. It's Geetha. Um, Geetha <laughs> is a cool name. Is Geetha, oh, the second name, that one I can't pronounce. Uh, <coughs> is Geetha after Geetha Thorksella daughter? Uh, see, see, uh, <laughs> see, you sounded I'm, like an iPhone trying to say somebody's name. Then. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. So, so, so theoretically, I'm actually just named after the the, the original name after the rune. Um, so the Nordic, the old Norse rune, the Gifu, um, which is where the name comes from. But basically, we're both named after the same rune, so it's the same name. Um, oh. And um, Nanny Og is in uh, Toe Practice, is also uh, named of the same thing. Yeah, Geetha of, Geetha of Wessex. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so uh, my parents definitely looked looked up the Geethas who existed when they chose the name. Um, but um, like she was she was the wife of Harry Harold, I think, wasn't she, or something at some point. Um, and um, but I they think basically took the them wife of Harry Harold. <laughs> <laughs> so i think um i think she um i think my mum basically had been looking up nordic uh sort of you know, norse stuff because she loves all of that yes. and um had come across the name first and then um yeah and then she decided to um to call me that and uh that's why it's got a very weird pronunciation because it's the rune gifu the fun thing is though because it's runic it's also got uh two different meanings depending on um I think it's the orientation. I can't remember. It's orientation or translation. But anyway, it either means a gift or it means woe, misery, and misfortune, Ooh. which is obviously much more on brand for a crime writer. So I'm going with yeah. it. <laughs> Happy uh, with that. Halo Scott says, what is the weirdest writing advice you have ever received? Oh, that's the weirdest. Mm. Um, oh God, that's such a good question. You can come back to that if you want. Immediate answer. Um, I got some really weird writing advice. I'll jump in for you a little bit. Go on, um, uh, Joseph Knox, who has been on the show, and I, he did this thing on Twitter where he had loads of books that he was trying to get rid of. And he said, does anyone want one? Like, just let me know your address. I'll send one. So I DM'd him and I said, can you send me a, a copy of the first one? Because I've not read the series and I'd like to get into it. I said, but can you do me a favor? Can you put some writing advice? And his writing advice was, always be drunk when you write. <laughs> it makes it much better. <laughs> and I was like, I, I mean, I'll try it, but I don't know if it's going to work. I'll give it a go. Honestly, you're not a proper author unless at some point you've asked, wait, was it right drunk and it's sober? Or was it the, or was it just all drunk? Yeah, yeah, so that's fine. That's, know, that's definitely yeah. good. <laughs> in, in my screenplay that I'm waiting for, feet, well, the next round on it in the screen craft competition, there is a scene in there where the um, typical Idris Elba kind of character in there tells everybody they've got to get drunk on the first night because that's the best way to write. And they all get drunk. God, isn't that so, interesting? Yeah. I mean, it is sort of playing as a stereotype of us as all being drunk all the time. Actually, I had to do a talk at my, yeah, I mean, a little bit. I mean, <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to do a drunk, no, I had to do a talk at my old school. Um, of like back in September, <laughs> um, and basically I was talking about like the myths of writers, and then I was like, one of the myths is that we just drink champagne all the time, or we're just perpetually drunk. And then I was like, it's basically completely true. <laughs> I 
<laughs> yeah, the, the successful writers, the rest of us drink this. Um, no. um, <laughs> story then about nerves and like you had to do a talk at your old school and you were nervous so you had a couple of shots before you went in that's why i yeah. thought that was gonna go <laughs> no um, i mean you know, i'd already had the shots in spite of not being nervous it was like... Keith, i've got to ask you this question we've got like 15 seconds left of the usual show we haven't even got into our staple questions but we've still got a couple of audience ones left are you willing to go over is that okay with you absolutely definitely Brilliant. So, thank you for that as well. Uh, Anya says, if you had to interview Dexter or Hannibal Lecter, which would you choose? Oh, would Dexter be in his like cage with the thing on? Is, I mean, Hannibal Lecter. Um, would be it's confession thing. time. I have never seen Dexter. What? Oh. I mean, I get, big... that out. You disgrace. I, I, I'm not interested in that kind of a. Oh, I'd want to offend people now. Um, that kind yeah, of you're digging a grave. Also, which, which version of Hannibal Lecter are we talking about? Book version? Are we talking about mm. one of the adaptations? Because it could, you know, it could be quite a hot adaptation. Mm. <laughs> I think that's going to make a difference. But actually, well, it's interesting because well, I find the whole, I find the whole, um, I, 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 I find it really interesting how we are so drawn to psychopaths. I find that mm. fascinating, and I, and I, I, um, I do think it's because. I think the reason those two characters are both so fascinating to us is it's like the, the psychopath who isn't all bad is somehow redeemable. And also it's like they're the psychopath who picks you mm. and you in your head are like the Clarice Starling character mm. um, because you are special and different and they tell you that you're special and different and it makes you feel good, right? The trouble is psychopaths tell you that stuff and it's not true. Mm. So it's a really, a really interesting thing. I think finding the whole idea of psychopaths fascinating would I want to interview one? Would I just get tied up in knots without wanting to be? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've I've known some narcissists in my time, so probably I'd be all right, I suppose. So maybe yeah. I would just I'd be, I'd both. I'd have I'd have to interview both, and then I'd be able to judge. Then I'd be able to give marks out of ten, both on hotness and interestingness. On <laughs> yeah. And then because they do have um, their hotness phase, don't they? Where like yes. Dexter at first, he's like, I do not, you know, sex is not appeal to me at all. And then and later then, down the line, he's like. This is actually quite fun. Um, yeah. And Hannibal Lecter is very much the same. Exactly. Well, he, he, he does some stuff in the, in the film, at least. I mean, he knows people's mad, anatomy. Mad. That's what he does. So. Yeah, it's the Mads Mikkelsen uh, Hannibal Lecter. He's the... Uh, mm. I, that's right. Yeah, he's the right actor, isn't he? Yes. 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 Um, yeah. Halo's question is kind of relevant to this. And we know what Halo's like, so expect a weird question in the best way. Um, would you rather eat your own liver or someone else's liver? Uh, uh, were they uh, using it? Were they using it? Uh, Ross, <laughs> Ross says, "What percentage of liver?" <laughs> and a uh, oh, delicious question. And she says, "Forty-seven percent." Forty-seven percent of their liver. Yes, I think that would still be fatal. Um, mm. I mean, I'm going to assume the other person wasn't using their liver at the time, and say someone else's liver. But I am yeah. a vegetarian, so probably. Mm. Not, I mean, people eat, eat liver, right? People do. Eat yeah, liver, yeah. Yeah, Actually, do, if you yeah. ate that much of someone's liver, you'd probably die of vitamin A poisoning. So, Oof. neither. I'm going to say, uh, if I had to eat somebody else's liver, it'd be Will Carver's because he's a vegan. So, he's probably got a very healthy liver. Yeah. But, no, he drinks a lot as well. So, it probably tastes like shit. <laughs> 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 so, Chris, let's let's jump on some um, some staple questions to finish the show with them because we haven't got mm. these in yet. Um, and we like to do these. So, Geetha. If you could take a fictional character from from writing uh, from in books from from TV programs or from films, and let's go <laughs> tying up in knots a scenario. Uh, let's take and you can take, take them out for the day. What character are you taking out and why? Oh yeah, so I'm probably going to not go with Dexter. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, weirdly, Chris Whitaker asked me who I'd like to date as a fictional character. Mm -hmm right at the beginning of my book launch as the first question he asked me without giving me mm. any warning. And I totally, totally couldn't think of anyone. And I said Hannibal Lecter because I just <laughs> didn't think of him. Um, So there we go. Like, um, that's not <coughs> actually what I think. I just literally blanked and was like, wow. that was like, that's not a good answer. So um, anyway, uh, who would I take out a fictional character? I'd quite like to take um, Hercule Poirot out, around because wow. I... Wouldn't he just be so much fun? 
Like you mm, could, yeah. he, he's like so mockable, but also so smart. I, I mm. like those qualities and he'd be very unthreatening. Like you could just, mm. and also you could take him somewhere like really loose and he'd be really shocked. It'd be great. So I don't know, that'd be quite fun. Um, mm. Definitely. But maybe he'd be a bit, maybe the smugness would get annoying after a while and I'd have to like ditch him um, somewhere and, you know, can do something more fun. But we'll see. Yeah, Do you have an answer for that, Chris? Or just playing with his beard or mustache. Yeah. That'd be what do you think, Chris? Would you, do you have a character you'd take out? Ah, oh, put me on the spot. Yeah, I'm going to say Thursday next from Jasper Ford's novels. Um, she jumps into different literary, um, well, different books. That's her job. She's an agent. Um, cool. But she'd be really cool. Yeah, she'd be really cool. Um, she's quite fun and feisty. And yeah, I'd love to have a drink with her. Nice. That's uh, okay. Next question. If you could change the ending to any fictional story, TV, literature, uh, or film, which which ending are you changing and why? Oh, that is a really hard question. It's a, it is a tough one. I like it. I mean, I mean, I my immediate sort of thought was change the ending of the film of I Am Legend back so to what they were originally going to do with it, which would have mm. made much sense, so that he does in fact develop an appreciation of the humanity of the zombies because that's where it was pointing and then it just didn't do it and that was very irritating and you went and slapped chris rock when i ruined the whole thing <laughs> absolutely that was i mean you know that was the main <laughs> either have you read the book i am legend actually no i haven't and i obviously should it is mm. amazingly so different to the, what the film is interesting yeah Maybe it's worth it's, it's quite a small read as well but it's worth reading so yeah, I for this do. next staple question, we're going to take you to a dark place, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but you're on your deathbed, and you're looking back at your writing career. What does success look like to you, and what, what will you be happy with? I mean, obviously, like the kind of like the nice, like humble responses. I've managed to, you know, touch some people's lives and just make enough money to survive. So I've finished, but. The other bit of me is like, you know, I've received an Oscar for writing the adaptation of the you know, screenplay adaptation of my New York Times number one best selling book. <laughs> 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 like, and I played the lead character because for some reason I turned out to be able to act at like mm. 50, having never been able to do it really very well before. Yeah. Oh. I'm going to throw in another morbid question, but this is a bit more fun. Um, so your <laughs> nen uh, your arch enemy in real life, I was going to say nen yeah, I, I was going to say, you were going to say nen enemy. I can't then. say it. <laughs> uh, I don't know why. But anyway, your arch enemy in real life, you get to write what's on their headstone. Um, so what are you going to write on that stone and why are you going to write it? Um... I don't really have many arch enemies. I mean, I've got some annoying exes. Like, oh yeah, an ex. Like, you do an ex? One of your exes, yeah, an ex. You've got an ex. You get to write what goes on the headstone. All right. Um, oh, this is good. This is fun. This is fun. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I I would I would choose to write. Yeah, you were right. It wasn't just an emotional affair, was it? <laughs> Perfect. That. I mean, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Fabulous. Here lies, yeah, you were right. Yeah. It wasn't just an emotional affair. <laughs> wasn't amazing. Right. <laughs> Keith, uh, thank you so, so much for joining us uh, tonight. It's been a wonderful experience. But before we do wrap this up, uh, can you let everyone know where they can find out more about you and where they can find out your book information. Great. So um, if you haven't been completely put off, <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, very findable on uh, Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, I'm very silly on all of them. Uh, I probably post most on Facebook, but I'm around. Um, and I'm Geetha Lodge, I think. Well, I'm the Geetha on Twitter, but if you search Geetha Lodge, there is only one Geetha Lodge which is quite a nice thing to be able to say, how I think about it. And um, 
my books are in um, Waterstones and on Amazon and periodically when they first come out they're normally in the supermarkets over here currently in Canada they are certainly in Walmart because um, I've just come off the shelves as being uh, Canadian book of the month I think so wow which was really nice and mm. I didn't get to see it in person but it was really nice I really wanted to go and have a look yeah. but um mm. but um but they should still be very much there um so you can grab little sister from there and um with its snazzy American cover and yeah um and in BNN uh certainly in the US as well so all those various places and um the new books are out um, April uh, is for, for, oh yeah, so Paperback of Little Sister is out in January over here. You've already got it in the States. Um, the new books, book, book five is out in April over here and in June in the States. So there we go. Amazing. Love it. Fantastic. It's a bit unfair that you guys get the, the early books, but there you go. Um, <laughs> great show. And he says, thank you. Um, absolutely brilliant interview and fantastic. Thank you, Githa. Amazing. Thanks for your feedback, guys. Thank you for your questions as well. I appreciate those. And yeah, they were back. great. Yeah, if you're listening back on the podcast, thank you. Or watching this back, thank you very much. We really appreciate you. Uh, um, <laughs> Russ says, Agate and Hooli, you were adequate. Uh, <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> thank you from Joanne Paulson. Um, guys, it's been a wonderful show. Love seeing you here, and uh, we'll see you all very soon. Um, look out for the after show party. Uh, thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Thank you.